Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of The Compressed Show. This is your host, L.A., and I'll be leading you on this mystical journey through the bullshittery that is Illusion of Gaia for the Super Nintendo. Let it be said that I do not hate this game. In fact, I rather like it. It has the notable honor of being the first RPG that I've ever played, so it holds a lot of nostalgia value for me. Let's get it started, shall we? Now, this game was made in the era before all of the movie-style games hit the market. Take the PlayStation-era Final Fantasy games, for instance. Seven began with an exciting bombing sequence, eight with an epic sword fight, and nine with a plot to kidnap a princess. And let's not even get started on Xenosaga for the PS2. So what exciting genre redefining opening can we expect from this game? How about a schoolhouse? Yeah, because that's always the best place to give us some nice exposition. To be fair, this isn't the only time that a school setting has been used to serve this purpose. Tales of Symphonia, I'm looking at you. The expedition begins with our hero speaking to us in the form of a journal entry. He informs us that his name is Will, and that a year has passed since he accompanied his father on an expedition to the Tower of Babel. The party met with an untold disaster, and Will barely made it back to the town of South Cape alive. Of course, Will doesn't elaborate on exactly what happened at the Tower of Babel, nor should we ever expect him to. Certainly it's because Will was too traumatized by the aforementioned event to tell it to us, and not because the storyboard writers were too lazy to come up with an explanation. No siree. Will vows to become an explorer one day like his father, Ullman. I'm sure he also watched reruns of Dora the Explorer as a kid and yelled, Swipe or no swiping at his TV set, along with countless other children across the land. By doing this, he hopes to meet his father, whom he just said met with disaster. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm sure this will end well. Anyway, the uh, teacher, Friar Dude, exposits the demons have been roaming around outside the town as of late. How convenient that this happens right as our epic adventure is about to begin. And why is he telling us this? Wouldn't his students know already? You'd think someone would have warned them before they stepped in some tall grass or something. Blah, blah, blah. Will has these friends named Lance, Eric, and Seth. Seth is the only one who's not blonde. I feel like I'm an East or something. And Seth... I suspect that some strong illicit substances were involved when his parents spawned him. I mean, just look at the guy. His sprite is downright creepy. Our boys are going to meet up at the cave by the seashore. If I heard something like this in real life, I'd assume that they were going to do drugs or sit off firecrackers or something, but not an innocent video game land. But before we go there to advance the story, let's explore South Cape, shall we? In the interest of keeping this video within its intended time frame, I've cut a lot of my original jokes out. However, I'd like to make a note of certain NPCs within the town. There are Seth's parents who chuck a pot at your head when you open the door to their house. The game explains that they fight a lot, but honestly, why would the pot fly out of the door unless one of them was aiming for it? I think they were really aiming at Will. He must not be too popular. There's also a weapon salesman who won't sell me anything, violating rule number 77 of RPGs or something, a guy who exposits about the comet of death approaching the earth, and a guy who collects red jewels. Pretty much, red jewels are the collectible items in this game, kind of like Stardust in Legend of Dragoon. Once you collect a certain amount of them, you trade them for items in the jeweler gem's inventory. One of the items on the list is my secrets. I'm intrigued. I'd sure like to hear some about his secret hobby of collecting push-up bras. Also, he has a rather badly translated line. If you select the option, give you red jewels, he will say, you don't have any red jewels. Let me give you some. Um, what? So he collects them, but he'll give you some? Is he talking about red jewels here? I hope he's not talking about his family jewels. There's also Eric's house, where we find his mother with smoke billowing out of her back. It looks like she's a robot whose jetpack malfunctioned. There are also some girls on the roof who are playing red light, green light. How does this game even exist in an age that most closely resembles medieval times? I don't think they had red and green lights back then, but I could be wrong. Eric's folks are the rich folks in town. I'm surprised that Eric isn't fat. This game sure knows how to break the cliches. In Will's house, we find Grandma Lola cooking a pie. 
On her bookshelf, apparently. What is she doing, bronzing the dough with the power of knowledge? Also, save spaces in this game are called dark spaces. Inside, Will talks to a disembodied human head with goat horns who calls himself Gaia, the source of all life. This is the only place where Will can write in his journal, aka save the game. Okay, Will, it's time to lay off the drugs now. Additionally, this needs to be said. Will looks exactly like Isaac from Golden Sun. When my brother and I saw the original screenshots for Golden Sun and Nintendo Power, we somehow tricked ourselves into thinking that they might be coming out with a sequel to this game. Wouldn't that be bizarre? Now, this town is home to the most frustrating red jewel in the whole game. I'm going to upload a video of it just so you can share my frustration with me. Keep in mind that after my first attempt at getting it, I accidentally walked back into the cave, thus requiring me to reset my game in order to get him to reappear. So damn frustrating. Story progression. When Will arrives at the cave, the boys are playing children's card games. Although Eric isn't one of the players, I can totally picture him yelling, screw the rules, I have money. Looks like I spoke too soon as Eric rushes in, telling us that the Mary Sue princess of Edward Castle has gone missing and has fled to South Cape. Surely our hero will never run into her in this booming metropolis. Lance and Seth steal my heart by giving even less of a damn than I do, which is an accomplishment. Now it's Gary Stew time! Eric wants to see Will's mysterious power. Um, if these boys are friends, wouldn't they have seen it already? And who exactly is he talking to here? I'm confused. By the way, that pink weapon-like thing on Will's back? It's not a sword. It's a flute. A pink flute. Oh, the inappropriate jokes just write themselves with this game. Also, the manliness factor is clearly over 9,000 here. By pressing L or R, Will can telekinetically move objects towards him. I find it kind of funny that the boys are talking controller speak here. Next, Lance puts four cards face down and asks Will to choose the Ace of Diamonds. This is completely pointless except to show us that Will has special psychic powers. Then the boys gush over Will's sixth sense or whatever, and then it's time to go home to where Grandma Lola has probably finished reading The Hobbit to her snail pie of wisdom plus seven by now. But who is waiting for Will when he gets home but gasp, a little piggy? By walking in place, the pig is apparently wrecking the whole room. Maybe he moved a dust bunny or something because I don't see any difference. But it's a trap. The pig actually belongs to none other than this girl, who we can already tell is Princess Kara by her cloyingly pink dress. She calls Will a little shabby and uses a whole bunch of ellipses. There are more dots in these text boxes than stars in the sky. She also asks if there's a piano because apparently Grandma Lola and Grandpa Bill are singing very loudly. Wow, they can do piano impressions with their voices. I wonder if they can do Guile's theme. I know I say this a lot, but why does this even need to be mentioned? Can he not hear their loud voices with Kara's nasally voice obliterating his eardrums? But oh no, it's crisis time. Some soldiers come in and whisk our princess away to the castle. I can't hate her too much here. Look how selfish she's being. Princesses in RPGs are usually demure and kind and boring. Way to break the mold, Enix. Before she leaves, she tells Will that she feels she's met him before. I puke a little in my mouth at the cliche factor. Worth noting here is some badly placed exposition about an, a viaduct that Grandpa Bill designed to keep prisoners from escaping Edward Castle. Why are they talking about this? Certainly not because Will's going to wind up there soon. One serving of escargot later, Will's narcolepsy kicks in and it's bedtime. He dreams that he and Kara took a trip around the world. You know, it's not even foreshadowing. Foreshadowing implies some degree of subtlety, and this is about as subtle as being hit by a school bus. The next morning, something begins to happen. I can't be the only one who got something perverted out of that sentence. King Edward has summoned Will to his palace, requesting that he bring Ullman's crystal ring. Will has no idea what the hell he's talking about, but goes anyway. This will end well. Lola teaches him a spell first, which is actually no more than a nice little melody. False advertising, Lola. And why does Will not know it already if you're humming it all the time with your super loud voice? Before I can meet with the king, I have to go see Kara. You know that I'm looking forward to this. 
The guard blocking Will's entrance describes him as just a shabby boy because I often use shabby to describe people I meet on a daily basis. Must be the adjective of the week. He steps aside when Kara threatens to tell Will his old nickname. What a professional! Some more insipid dialogue. The king hired a hunter. Mom and dad have been acting strangely. Certainly an original plot development. She longs to leave the castle. I just can't take the originality here. Now it's time to meet King Edward. Both he and his wife have rather light-colored hair, so that leads me to believe that Kara must be the milkman's son. Scandalous! Also, Edward has let himself go since his days of sucking blood out of mountain lions. Eddie boy, if your fangirls see you, they'll cut themselves. Since Will doesn't possess the crystal ring, he's thrown in prison for his impudence. Gasp! I'm sure that I'm supposed to see Edward as Dick, but I just see him as less of a character and more of a plot device at this point. He might as well be a cardboard box with a smiley face drawn onto it. Also, the queen's name is Edwina, which is vaguely disturbing to me. Edward and Edwina, they're like fraternal twins. Will runs around in his prison cell, angsting like mad. Eventually, he falls asleep, on his feet, I might add. In his dream, he hears his father's voice coming from his pretty princess Barbie flute, and he decides to lay off the LSD in the future. He begins asking where his father is, but Daddy has more important things to talk about, such as Grandma Lola's snakeskin pies. Certainly vital plot info. Daddy can't tell Will his location because that would be too convenient and logical. Of course. Turns out Daddy was once in the same prison cell. Why? We never find out. Maybe he was the milkman involved in Kara's creation, which would make the two of them you know, never mind. There's some horrible exposition about these stones which give you an extra life and some evil crystal WTF. Anyway, Will is instructed to go to the Incan ruins to collect the first mystic statue. I'm confounded yet again as South Cape seems to be distinctly medieval and European. So not only is Will in the wrong place for that, he's in the wrong time frame. You know, whatever. I'm no history buff, but it's still weird. Next, it's Hamlet to the rescue. Somehow the pig got into prison with a key tied to his tail. You'd think one of the guards would have noticed that. Without further ado, Will busts out of that joint, but not before stopping to write in his diary. See you guys next time for the exhilarating prison break.